This Christmas, we're gonna slow down. This Christmas, we're gonna buy less, eat less, and worry less. For the four weeks of Advent, we're going to prepare our hearts for hope to overwhelm despair, for peace to stamp out war, for joy to come in the morning, for love to put hate to death. Because Christmas is not about shopping and debt and noise, it's about counting down the days until God slips into the world to be with us. Join us during the season of Advent as we journey together, slow down, and wait for a love that makes all things new. We hear your angel Gabriel and witness the faith of Mary. Fill us with your grace and light. We recall the times we we have struggled, but yes, we know times when God has filled us and our world with blessing. We remember. Mary was a young, strong, spiritual woman. Even though her life was not easy, she heard God's voice and said yes. Her song was a prayer that would uplift others. Her lyrics shattered the proud and called the world to change. She would bear within her the light of the world. This Advent, we respond to God's beckoning to us as well. Revealing God, visit us and fill us with your spirit. Bring your good news to life within us. Give us courage to be still and know you that we might carry your light into injustice and brokenness of, the, of this world. Amen. Amen. Amen.
will you join me now in the prayer of approaching confession? Holy One, we have come, the faithful and those who occasionally have trust issues, the courageous and those who find fear and anxiety keeps them from doing the work of love, the open-hearted and those who cling to resentments and never feel they have enough. We have come, recognizing that we are a mixture of these traits, never as devoted as we believe ourselves to be in our grandiosity, never as inept or unlovable as we deem ourselves in our moments of shame. We come because we've caught wind of the news that your love comes to turn the world and our lives upside down. We give thanks for the gospel truth that this is so. And we bring you ourselves, all of ourselves, trusting that you lift up the lowly and you will cast down our false pride. In the waters of baptism, we are reminded of your grace, which loves us as we are and loves us too much to let us stay that way. So hear the sound of love poured out. O oh Lord, open our lips and our mouths will declare your praise. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Amen. No more let sins and sorrows grow. Lord, Hey everyone, welcome to the Message for Young Disciples. And this week we have a very special announcement to start with, which is that today, December 20th, at 1145 a.m., there is going to be a live reading of the Christmas story from Luke's Gospel that is going to be over Zoom, and the kids of Emmanuel are going to be doing the reading of the Christmas story. And it will be the same Zoom link as Celebrations and Concerns, which is in the e-presence. So it'll be tacked on right at the end. So please, kids, come hear your friends read the story. If you're not reading the story yourself, which you might be, and everyone come enjoy this amazing live reading of the Christmas story from Luke. As we head into the week of Christmas, this is the last Sunday of Advent. So it's a really wonderful time to focus on the story and the gospel and really get grounded in the story because this story is pretty unexpected, right? The story of Christmas, the reason that we celebrate it is that it was so momentous. It was so amazing and important and it was so unexpected, right? God came into the world through the form of a baby and you guys and me and everybody here are living through super unexpected times, right? You know that every day is unexpected right now since the pandemic. And um, this story is a really good reminder that God comes to us in unexpected times and in unexpected ways, sometimes in ways that we didn't plan for or we don't even want. But God is always coming to us no matter if we expect it or think it should be or plan for it or not. So as we head into the week of Christmas, I hope that you guys can celebrate with your families and celebrate with the story and that the story reminds you that God is always with you, even in unexpected ways. So I hope you have a wonderful week and have a merry, 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 merry Christmas. 
Tears are falling, hearts are breaking, and we need to hear from God. You've been promised, we've been waiting, welcome Holy Child. once again to the reading and proclamation of your word. We pray, God, that you would help us to experience your word anew, like snow falling freshly into our spirits. Give us a good drink from your living water through this reading and proclamation, that we might find exactly what we need for this day's journey. Bless the preacher now in preaching and your word truly to our hearing. Amen. As we prepare to hear the passage from Luke that Pastor Katie is about to read, keep in mind that Mary, as a young woman from a tiny town in Galilee, would have had very little status or say in the culture of her day. Listen for how the angel Gabriel addresses her with honor even before she agrees to cooperate with his message. Listen for the message that he brings her, and listen for how she responds. And finally, pay particular attention to the content and the tone of her song, a song that we know as Mary's Magnificat. Listen for the word of God through Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 56. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph in the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom, there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born holy. He will be called Son of God. 
And now, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for God has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is God's name. God's mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. God has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary, Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. May the gospel be more to us than mere words. May your Holy Spirit produce in us strong conviction. Amen. In Paulette Giles' novel, News of the World, set in post-Civil War North Texas, the aging veteran captain Jefferson Kyle Kidd travels from town to town reading the news to people who can't or don't want to read it for themselves. He's a widower rootless and solitary, moving through life relatively content with his existence. That is, until he's offered a $50 gold piece to deliver a 10-year-old orphan girl to her relatives in San Antonio. He takes up the task, and that's when the real adventure begins. Over time and trial, the old captain and his young charge bond. At a critical point in the action, Captain Kidd reflects on his life as a courier and a runner and back to his deceased wife and his two still living daughters. And he thinks to himself, maybe life is just carrying news, surviving to carry the news. Maybe we have just one message that is delivered to us when we are born. And we are never sure what it says may have nothing to do with us personally, but it must be carried by hand through a life all the way, and at the end, handed over sealed. What if life really is just carrying news? What if each of us has been entrusted with one important message given to us when we're born or baptized that we carry through our lives? As a preacher, I have to say that I like that idea, not just for those of us who climb into pulpits on the regular to deliver sermons, but for every follower of Jesus, every human being, period. 
you're all of us message bearers of one kind or another. Like it or not, the way we live communicates something to others. Well, I take issue with the notion that we hand that message over still sealed at the end of our lives. I do know this. The message we are called by God to carry is not finally about us. You may not always be exactly sure of what the message says or what the precise implications and impacts of the message our lives carry to others may be, but we can be sure it's not about us. What if life is about carrying news. When the angel Gabriel appeared to a young woman named Mary in the Galilean town of Nazareth, he came bearing some news for her. That's what the word angel literally means after all, it means messenger. Gabriel begins, greetings favored one, the Lord is with you. Mary, the passage says, was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Well, of course, if she seems a little confused, a little taken aback by Gabriel's greeting at first, we shouldn't be all that surprised. Why was Gabriel calling her favored? The idea that a young, not yet married woman from a backwater town in a backwater province in a backwater country occupied by the mighty Roman Empire would somehow be a favored one, would have run contrary to conventional wisdom, even the religious wisdom of the day. Being wealthy, being wed, being male, being from the right tribe and the right sort of town and the right sort of province in a country that wasn't under foreign occupation, all of those things would have been perceived as some sort of favor from God or blessing or at least good fortune in those days, as they might be by some today. That, of course, wasn't Mary's lot. And yet Luke's gospel affirms that it is to Mary that Gabriel brings his news. You are favored. God is with you. The message doesn't stop there, of course. Gabriel goes on to tell her that she will be overshadowed by God's spirit, give birth to a child who will be called the Son of God. What an honor. Favor, a more accurate rendering of the Greek word is grace. The favor and presence of God is not indicated by our external circumstances. Cash and prizes, the imputed benefits of being born into a particular status, race and class, and the relative lack of hardship and illness in life aren't signs that God is somehow more pleased with or more in favor of those who have them. Indeed, part of the news in the story and song of Mary and in the whole narrative of the Gospel of Luke and in the Beatitudes in Matthew's Gospel and in the words of the Hebrew prophets is that God's favor, some scholars call it God's preferential option, actually leans in the direction of the poor, the widow, the orphan, the foreigner, the sick, the oppressed, the vulnerable, and the imprisoned. These are the least of these through whom the king comes to us, according to Matthew 25. These are the lowly who are lifted up and the hungry who are filled with good things in Mary's song. We misunderstand Mary's message and the gospel itself if we don't understand that it turns the world and its conventional wisdom upside down. Dietrich Bonhoeffer proclaimed this same news in Advent of 1934 when he wrote, that is the wonder of all wonders, that God loves the lowly. God chooses people to be God's instruments and performs God's wonders where one would least expect them. God is near to lowliness. God loves the lost, the neglected, the unseemly, the excluded, the weak and broken. Where human beings say lost, God says found. Where people say condemned, God says saved, where people say no, God says yes. That's a message worth carrying and embodying in our lives. So instead of getting lost in the question of exactly who God might favor more, perhaps the better tack to take is to focus on what it meant for Mary and what it might mean for each of us to carry the news of God's incarnate love 
especially for the lowly in our lives as individuals, and as a community. Mary is the one who literally gave birth to that love, which is why the Greek Orthodox tradition calls her the Theotokos or the God bearer. But part of the good news of the gospel is that we ourselves can share in bearing God into the world through our words and actions. In a way, we can also be Theotokos. Perhaps the best way to do that is by saying, as Mary said to Gabriel, here I am, let it be to me according to your word, which is accepting and embracing the work of being a channel through which God's love and provision flow to others. One of the things I have learned over my years in life and ministry is that this let it be to me according to your word stance in life, which some might call our spiritual condition, has to be regularly maintained. We do this through practices and disciplines like engaging in prayer and meditation, regularly studying scripture and doing other spiritual reading in community, taking part in rituals like Advent wreath lighting, doing acts of service, engaging in deep conversation with friends on the journey who inspire us and hold us accountable, taking risks for the sake of compassion and justice, giving in ways that stretch us and call us to trust more deeply. We do this work, this let it be to me according to your word work, so that we can join Mary in the work of bearing God, or at least carrying the message of God's love into the world. It is then that we can join her in singing, my soul magnifies the Lord. An interesting phrase that, my soul magnifies the Lord. When we magnify something, whether it be a single-celled organism with a microscope or a distant planet with a telescope, our perception of it grows. It expands. So let me close with a few stories of people whose lives have carried the message of God's love in ways that magnify the Lord for me. Thursday a week ago, a number of Emmanuel members and Pastor Katie and I had the chance to be part of a Zoom call with Dennis Smith, who's one of our recently retired PCUSA mission co-workers. He spent his career working in Central and South America, often with very poor and threatened populations first came to know Emmanuel members years ago when a team from Emmanuel went down to visit Guatemala. Every time I have ever heard and seen Dennis speak, he has carried the news of how God is at work in the places he served. I've always noticed the joy that shines through him. His soul magnifies the Lord. Two days later, I was part of an extended family and lifelong friends Zoom memorial service for our own Carolyn Evans, led by her nephew, Reverend Alec Evans. We'll be having our own Emmanuel celebration of her life next fall when we can meet in person. Listening to Carolyn's dear ones tell story of her kindness and care for all, her energizer bunny enthusiasm and joy, I remembered all the ways she shared with us and her, shared those with us in her long years at Emmanuel and all the ways she took part in the worship, service, fellowship, and study of this congregation. Carolyn's soul magnified the Lord, as did the soul of Irene Alum, who died just a few weeks after Carolyn. The care and joy she brought to the kids she worked with in our Sunday school and the older adults she played piano for at Chesterbrook residences will not be forgotten. Of course, Carolyn and Irina are just two of the recently deceased Emmanuel members and friends whose lives carried the message of God's love, whose souls magnified the Lord. The sermon would never end if I tried to name them all. Saturday a week ago, the same day her family and I were celebrating Carolyn's life, a group of white nationalists tore down a Black Lives Matter banner in front of Metropolitan AME Church in downtown DC. In an article in the Washington Post written in response, the pastor of that church, William Lamar IV, spoke of how we need to create a new narrative if we are serious about imagining a better world. 
one that tells a true story of humans thriving together and sharing the abundance of the land and their labor. Then he went on to carry the news of a God for all people and not just some. As a preacher, he said, I view what happened in the yard of our church as a showdown between the God of the universe, the God of all people, the God incarnate in Jesus Christ, and the small G God of white supremacy. One God is for all. The other God is for some. One God has chosen humanity. The other God has chosen whiteness, imperialism, and human subjugation. William Lamar IV is undaunted by the actions of those who tore down his congregation's sign. He is not responding to them with hatred and vitriol. He is committed to a God whose love is larger than tribal division, a God who is for all and not just for some. William Lamar IV's soul magnifies the Lord. Later in this worship service, you will hear people on our coordinating team for our facets hypothermia prevention efforts carry the news of the way your generosity and the generosity of local restaurants is helping provide meals this week and a week in March for some of our fellow children of God experiencing homelessness. When I hear about that, the news of gift bags delivered and prepared for the residents of Chesterbrook and cookies baked and delivered for dear Emmanuel members and friends and sandwiches made for Martha's table and eight SUVs full of food collected and delivered to share through recent neighborhood food drives and so many other things I could mention. My soul magnifies the Lord. Maybe life really is just carrying the news. The news we carry as followers of Jesus is not about us. It's about how God, God of all people, who is near to lowliness and loves the lost, the neglected, the unseemly, the excluded, the weak and broken. The God to whom Mary said, here I am, let it be to me according to your word, can work in, through, beyond and yes, sometimes even in spite of us. Hail favored ones, we have news to carry. In Jesus' name, amen. falling snow, we pray that you would come into our hearts just as gently. 
where we hold on to hardness of heart, God, send your spirit to enter in, that we might learn to live truly with your compassion at our center. We pray, God, for our daily bread, and that when we have daily bread, God, we pray that you would give us hunger for justice. Help us to live into the good news that you have for each and every one of your beloved children this day. God, as gently as falling snow, send your spirit to enter in. We lift all of the prayers of our hearts to you, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Grace and peace to you, Emmanuel. As today marks the finish of our Hypothermia Prevention Hosting Week in partnership with FACETS, together we give thanks to God. We give thanks to God for meals sponsored generously through general authoring support as well as individual giving. Meals prepared by local restaurants, including Wayne Family Restaurant, Moby Dick, Kimberly's Catering, McLean Pizza, Lebanese Taverna, Claire and Bond's Beat Shack. We give thanks to God for the work of your hands as you made and donated baked goods, beverages, fruit, snacks, ice, and more. We give thanks for our partner congregations in hypothermia prevention. McLean Islamic Center and Temple Rodolf Shalom, we are so grateful for you. As your 2020 hypothermia leadership team, we give such thanks to God for your generosity and support of our hypothermia prevention program in partnership with FACETS. We give thanks to God for warm, warm hands, hands and, and warm, warm, warm hearts. hearts. Amen. Amen. the prayer of thanksgiving and dedication. God, teach us to share your grace, we pray. With gratitude and joy, we share these lives you have given us in a way that we steward our time, our talent, and treasure. Hear our thanks, giver of grace. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>
favored ones, we have news to carry. So let us say, let it be to me according to your word. Let our souls magnify the Lord. May the grace, mercy, and peace of God, our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer, be and abide with each and every one of us today and every day, evermore. Amen.